Governor Corbett, welcome to the Reading Eagle. We appreciate you taking time today out of your busy schedule to come in and spend some time uh, answering some questions for sure. us uh, during this uh, political campaign. Uh, we're going to try to keep this organized by um, having two people an asking the questions of you. Uh, first, Ron Southwick is our uh, news editor and he directs our political coverage. And Liam Migdale Smith is our lead political reporter. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to them, and they'll be the people that will be uh, talking to you. Good. Okay. And you guys are just watching? We are. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for being here, Governor. Uh, why don't we start very simply? Uh, you're asking voters in a couple months to, to re-elect you. Uh, why do you think uh, Pennsylvania's voters should give you a second term? Well, hopefully they'll remember what, uh, what I campaigned on in 2010. I made very distinct promises. In fact, we have a scorecard that I didn't bring with me. I don't know if you have it with you that we'll give you uh, of the various types of promises we made, but boiled down to fiscal discipline, to limited government, and to the belief in the free enterprise system growing us back from uh, the economic problems that we've had. And I can very easily um, say to the people of Pennsylvania, we kept the promises that we made to you. It was not easy. Uh, we knew there were difficult choices when there was a $4.2 billion deficit uh, in, the, uh, in the budget, which included a, a, uh, over a billion dollars in education funding that occurred in the prior administration, not in my administration. You know, contrary to what uh, elected officials are saying out there, candidates against me are saying out there, and what the uh, teachers unions have been saying against me. We did not cut the education funding. Uh, but in addition to that, we inherited an 8.1% unemployment rate. It's now down to 5.7%. I think uh, here in Reading, you're actually a tenth of a point below that, if I recall correctly, at 5.6%. Uh, we see an economy that is uh, slowly improving, not as quickly as I would like to see it, but I think uh, that's, uh, that's occurring in many uh, parts of the uh, country, particularly coming out of Washington and, and with the difficulties going on uh, in Washington that we have no uh, control over. Well, um, so, you know, we can start off there and probably build upon that with, with your questions, but, you know, um, I, I believe that we, we kept the promise of reducing our spending because we had to. We did not have the money. You know, uh, G.T. Thompson's a congressman from North Central Pennsylvania who carries a banner around with him that I believe in. And it says that you can't spend more than you have. I think you probably understand that you can't spend more than you have. Well, we had $27 billion. We didn't have almost $29 billion. Prior administration increased the budget of Pennsylvania by almost $8 billion in eight years during the recession when revenue was going down. So all funds were, were, were stripped out. There was nothing left you know, when I got in there. And in fact, they used the federal stimulus money, it was one-time stimulus money that was not supposed to be used for operating systems, gave it to the school districts, told them don't use it for operating system, even though uh, the operating budget, even though the state government used it as operating budget. Uh, and people wonder, well, what happened to the education funding? Well, it's clear. If you give them federal money and the federal money doesn't come in, then you have two choices, raise taxes or not be able to give it to them. Uh, and I made a promise we weren't going to raise taxes, and we haven't raised taxes. So if, they, if we want to go through, uh, I have a list of all the accomplishments uh, that we've made. And I think, frankly, people forget about it, and it's impossible to get out there in a 30-second TV ad. Uh, but l let me just give you a, a, an example. Uh, we said we'd make the, the uh, state government more accountable to Pennsylvania families and taxpayers. So how do we do that? Well, we eliminated, uh, we, we, we began government reform right away in the first year. We fixed that $4.2 billion deficit. Our size of government, number of employees, went down to its lowest level in 50 years. We created an innovation office in the governor's office that saved uh, nearly $700 million over the, the last three years. Uh, part of that was reducing the size of the vehicle fleet. You might remember that commercial. Uh, we said we reduced it by 20% in eight years. We were a little off. We reduced it by 20% in three years. Uh, and we did it by applying business principles, not necessarily, you can't, you know, government will never operate like a business. But you can apply some principles. We said who needs to have a car, who doesn't need to have a car. And we worked that out. 
Um, one area that gets very little coverage, except at the time it happened, but is having a huge impact, is uh, we instituted our Justice Reinvestment Reinve Initiative to transform and uh, begin the process of transforming our correction system to try and get people into the level of corrections that they need and get them out of taking up jail space uh, in the prisons, uh, which cost, you know, I think about $50,000 a person at, at this point in time. And you see the leveling out of our jail population to a, a certain point. We, we said we were going to talk about more uh, jobs, less taxes. We have the lowest unemployment rate in six years. Uh, we've added uh, um, close to 180,000 private sector jobs in that period of time. Uh, we've reduced taxes. We eliminated the inheritance tax on the family farm. Eliminated the inheritance tax on the small family business, which drives a great deal of the economy of, of Pennsylvania. Uh, we uh, passed a manufacturing tax credit in a bipartisan way, Democrats and Republicans, that will allow us to uh, use the ethane from our natural gas to bring businesses to Pennsylvania, to bring major industry uh, to Pennsylvania, that major industry being uh, the plastics industry. We made ourselves more efficient in the Department of Revenue, and I particularly want to uh, point this one out. When we entered office, the prior administration, it gets evaluated every three years uh, by the uh, Council on State Taxation, had given Pennsylvania a D rating. Uh, when we, after we've been in there, it became an A rating, or A minus rating. I don't want to over exaggerate. It's an A minus rating. Um, we passed tort reform. We promised we would do pass tort reform. And these are all things that uh, many of the newspapers have been uh, um, engaged in, in supporting uh, so that we could reduce the uh, frivolous lawsuits. Uh, transportation funding, which was never in the discussion at the time that I was running because it was necessary, because our bridges were failing, our roads were failing. In order to, I look at it from a public safety standpoint, we want our motors to be safe, particularly those buses that carry our very valuable commodity, our children. 1.5 million uh, children uh, each year, uh, each day, get on 31,000 school buses. Um, so we, we were able to pass that funding, as I said, in a bipartisan way. One of the aspects that still continues, and I'm sure you're going to have questions about it, is the issue of property tax and property tax reform. Uh, and when, we, when I entered office, I think there were 12 exceptions that a school district could apply to not have to have a referendum. We got it reduced to three. Unfortunately, one of those threes is pensions. And today, 163 school districts are raising their pension, are raising their property taxes beyond uh, the cost of living index without having to go to a referendum because of the, uh, of the pension crisis. When I walked into office, we had a $3 billion debt that we owed the federal government. Um, we've, uh, we've paid that off by this time borrowing some money. We were paying the government at a 4% interest rate. They were being very generous with us at 4% interest rate. We floated a bond, it's 1.2%. So we paid that off. That affects everybody in this room that is either an employer or an employee. Because what it affects is the, the rate that you're paying into your, into your uh, FUTA tax, it's called, to the tune of $385 billion, e excuse me, million dollars, I wish I had $385 <laughs> billion, $385 million to uh, the, the people of Pennsylvania uh, on a yearly basis. Um, obviously, we've made Pennsylvania a, you know, the number two leader in the production of natural gas. We're an energy leader. We're number four in coal, number two in natural gas. When I entered office, we were number five uh, in natural gas. Uh, we've become a net exporter. We were a net importer. When we say exporter, we don't mean outside the country. It's to other states, primarily over to New Jersey and over in, into New York State and up into the, uh, into the Northeast uh, at this point where the, the gas lines are going. Um, going on, you know, I'm just scratching the tip of the iceberg in some respects. Uh, in education funding, uh, you know my difference of opinion with uh, you know, that we did not cut it. It was cut before I walked in the, in the door. Uh, but today we spend $12 billion on state funding. It's the highest level it's ever been. And it's all state money. It's not one-time uh, stimulus money from the federal government. That's 41% of our budget. At the same time, the, the cost of health and human services is 41% of the budget. So in order to do anything else, as you can see, that's 82% of the budget. If you count the uh, debt service and corrections, we're at 90% of the budget. 
We have 10% for everything else that we do, including programs like uh, Legago Works and being able to fund those. Um, that that uh, we've included um, investments in uh, high quality early childhood education. Uh, we've increased it by 24% uh, to up to $374 million. And for the first time in six years, uh, we increased funding uh, to special education by $20 million. And special education and the funding formulas are two things that are clearly going to be uh, on the table in the next in the, in the next uh, term uh, that I have. It has to be. I mean, we can't get away uh, from this. But we didn't look at education from just a standpoint of how much money are we talking about. It's like how do we how do we measure? I think you and I had a conversation about you know you have to have metrics. Mm -hmm. How do we measure? And when I campaigned four years ago, I talked about the fact that the, the teachers uh, were rated as satisfactory or unsatisfactory. 99.2% of the teachers were rated satisfactory. Does so anybody believe that 99.2%, maybe 90, maybe even 92%, but 99.2%? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't think there was a, an accurate measurement going on. 99.4% of the administrators, the principals, were rated. And working with the teachers, the administrators, the parents, uh, and the Department of Education, we came up with a new uh, principal evaluation system, administrators evaluation system, and a new teacher's evaluation system. That working there has allowed us, through that, to take a look at the performance of each school. I don't mean school district, I mean each school. And last year, and you're going to see them coming out again here in the next month or so, uh, we were able to uh, provide the parents, the taxpayers, the teachers, um, the students if they want to look at it, a school performance profile. Uh, and we have a comprehensive web website that provides everybody the opportunity to take a look and see if that high school or that middle school or that grade school is performing, how it's performing, where is it ranked in, in the uh, state. Is it, you know, 90% above, which we consider, you know, um, to be a, a good grade? Is it an average grade, you know, 80 to 90? Is it a real average grade, 70 to, to uh, 80, or is it failing below, below 70 and, and needs help? And the whole idea is not to punish anybody, it's to give people the idea of uh, having an, an idea of what's going on in their school districts if they want to improve it. Uh, what we have found is it's not necessarily the rich districts that have all the high performing ones. There's a school district in northern Somerset County, it's almost in Cambria County, almost in Johnstown, called Winburg. Uh, and the middle school there uh, performed in the top 90%, yet their tax rate is the second worst in, the, in the, their collections, is the second worst in the entire 500 school districts of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's not how much you spend, oftentimes, it's how you invest, how you spend it. Is there some true thought process rather than just redoing the same thing year in uh, and year out? Well, in addition to that, we created the Ready to Learn block grant so that more money would get to the classroom uh, rather than into other issues. Uh, we created the Ready to Succeed scholarship just this past year that's going to help students, uh, families that uh, make above the level that they're going to be able to get um, a fee loan or a Pell Grant, but below the level that they're comfortable paying for. That they would probably have to go out and get a commercial a market where they're going to be able to, if they perform well after their freshman year in, uh, in college, uh, get up to $2,500 grant uh, to help them with their uh, uh, schooling. Um, one of the areas that, w that we have developed, and I find it ironic that the, my opponent doesn't seem to know about it because he says he wants to connect education with manufacturing. Uh, we've already done that and we've uh, created a targeted industry program that would provide uh, students grants to enroll in certificate programs, training, you know, uh, uh, mechanical training, uh, trades, uh, electrical training, um, to support the high demand industries in, in Pennsylvania today. Uh, in addition, is you're probably aware of the existing um, uh, educational investment tax credit that was created under Tom Ridge that helps uh, uh, non-public schools and, um, by allowing a business and you guys should probably do this, I don't know if you do, to take a write-off on a certain contribution up to $200,000 to go to schools to help them uh, in, in these private, they can be parochial schools, 
uh, to um, be able to be an alternative uh, to the schools. We took that from $75 million grant, or, or uh, right on, excuse me, not right off, but $75 million in tax credits to $100 million in tax credits. We also created the Opportunity Scholarship Tax Credit, aimed at the children in the 15% worst performing school buildings in the state of Pennsylvania. And that if a child there wants to go to another public school, that they'd have an opportunity where they, their parent feels that they would do better, or to a private school, or to another charter school, they would be able to take, uh, be able to go there. And that tax credit uh, is up to $50 million. First year, it was a little underutilized. It's still a little underutilized, but it's getting uh, closer. Um, and finally, over on the uh, Health and Human Services side, um, we've increased funding for public health and human services by uh, almost a billion dollars uh, for our seniors, for our children, for our individuals living with disabilities who have been on waiting lists. We've reduced the waiting list uh, considerably. So that today we spend uh, $13.1 billion in health and human service related uh, issues. Um, for our, our seniors, we made the largest investment in the programs. The investment was $550 million and removed over 6,000 seniors that were sitting uh, on lists, uh, waiting lists for support services. The one that um, really I try to drive home, and, and a lot of people don't notice it, but it's extremely important if you've ever been anywhere near the community I'm going to talk about right now. We reduced the waiting list for services uh, for people, individuals living with severe physical or mental uh, disabilities. We've reduced it by over 4,000 people. We've increased the funding by 23.5 million people, bringing it uh, to a total, I believe, about $1 billion. What am I talking about? I'm talking about individuals who have aged out of the system after they hit 21. They could be 20, they could be 30, they could be 40, they could be 50. We really don't have a network for those who are severely uh, disabled. In most instances, it's a family member, whether a brother, sister, mother, father, aunt, uncle, somebody in that area. Um, and if you've ever had the opportunity to uh, meet these individuals, you know how tough their life is, but also how tough it is on the caregiver. Um, and we do have services, we had, we had waiting lists. If you recall, when I first got into office, the first budget had to be the toughest one. We weren't able to pay out any more you know, state cash assistance. You know, the state had been paying out $200 a month to people on welfare's cash assistance to spend as they saw fit. It wasn't a federal program, it was just our program. It was $200 million going to people who were able-bodied and who could take care of themselves. If I said $200 million, I'd $200. <laughs> Please correct me if I was <laughs> if I misspoke. I th met with these people who are severely disabled and said, "Why are they on waiting lists? They're the first ones that we should be giving money to." And so some of that two hundred dollars a person went over into that area to take care of them because that's what society is supposed to do. It doesn't make a lot of uh, uh, publicity or anything, but that's what good governing is about taking care of those who can't take care of themselves. Um, and then obviously we invested more than $123 million in the CHIP healthcare program uh, here in Pennsylvania. Our coverage now is 203,000 uh, children. Uh, we've had a lot to do with changing the laws and as it comes to um, taking care of children, particularly those of uh, abuse as a result of the Sandus Sandusky trial. Uh, the task force that I put together along with the legislature, headed up by the district attorney of Bucks County, um, and I just lost his name. What? Heckler. Oh yeah, Dave Heckler. <laughs> Don't tell him I didn't remember. Uh, but uh, and David did a wonderful job. He had been a state senator, state rep, state senator, been a judge, and then uh, became district attorney, uh, and he did a great job on that. So, if I was able to say that to everybody, so here's what we've done. It's not, I have a plan, and I won't give you details. Here's what we've done. Imagine what we can do with four more years. I think one of the biggest uh, issues that you've been pursuing lately is, has been the pensions. I mean, you've made that your signature issue. What do you hope to see in the fall? And if, if nothing happens you know, between now and, uh, and the election, if you're reelected, what would you want to do e next e year? Even if something happens, 
It's only a start. I can't remember. Did we come down here and talk to you all about this before? I've been to some of okay. Then you haven't changed your mind. This is this is the 800-pound gorilla. Actually, it's about an 80,000-pound gorilla sitting in the middle of the room. We have to deal with it. Okay. Unions may not like that. We have to deal with it. Taxpayers may not understand it completely, but we have to deal with it. And when I f finally started re relaying going around the state for the month of uh, July and August and talking to individuals about their property tax and how that played into their state, uh, in, into the school teacher's pension that the school district had to contribute, they started getting it. Uh, but you know, we also have to contribute to the teachers. And it's not just the teachers, it's all of the pensions uh, that are government pensions uh, in Pennsylvania under the state. But, and I have not talked to the mayor here, I, I'm just going to guess because third class cities, one of the biggest issues is the pensions that they have to pay and how it is affecting their uh, bottom lines. Because we're paying pensions based on a system that is, what, 50 years old? When people thought that you know, we would have the money for this, that people wouldn't live as long as they as they live, so we you know, we we have to a acknowledge this is a problem, which my opponent hasn't done yet, but b we have to deal with it. We can't say well, you know, it doesn't apply to anybody. Nobody is going to be affected. We're just going to bury our head in the sand and continue the way we are. Uh, and I hope the people of Pennsylvania understand that because if not. The only alternative is to raise taxes over and over and over again, both at the local level and at the state level. $610 million new each year is going to go to the pension crisis in Pennsylvania. In 1718, $3.3 billion of the budget, and we're only at $29.1 billion right now, will go to the pension. Do you think we're going to grow that fast? I wish we would grow that fast, but we would just be covering what we already have to pay. There would be no additional money to go and do all the things that people would like us to do. I suspect that if we counted up all the requests for money that we have, the budget of Pennsylvania would be probably about $40 billion. We don't have it. And I don't think the people are willing to pay the taxes for that. I mean, one of the, one of the big plans that's come forward. It's the one you've endorsed, the Tobash plan. I mean, it, do you think that that's going to get us the savings we need, short term, long term? It, it gives you some savings, short term, but more importantly, it gives you momentum. This is sort of like getting the ball rolling a little bit, getting them to to face it. You know, it's the end of the session. I've been talking about this for two years. It's the end of the session, so I don't know that they're going to uh, deal with that. Um, but if they don't, I believe we need to come back, and I'm going to call for, when I come back in, a special session on pensions, all the pensions. Because if we're working on the states, uh, we might as well be working on how does that affect it, how does that help uh, the local communities. I think you get more partners involved in it then, you might get more allies involved in it. Who's opposed to it? Who's opposed to pension reform? Yeah, that's an easy story, for, that's a Sunday edition story. <laughs> Who's opposed to it? You know, public sector unions. Oh, we can't change it. And they'll say, and, and legislators, I don't know about judges, but I don't know how any judge in Pennsylvania can hear the case if we ever get sued, if we pass it. Because don't they have a conflict of interest? And I would hope that the media would scream bloody murder if any one of the judges whose pension is involved considered hearing a case. And I don't know how they do it. That's not fair to the people of Pennsylvania. So if this is getting the ball rolling, what are the next steps? Well, we're going to announce something in the next couple of days uh, to set something in motion for next year. Uh, because the one thing that I recall from my days working with Governor Ridge in the special session on crime is we had done a lot of the legal, not legal work, but a lot of the research and, and stuff beforehand come up with all the uh, various alternatives. There was a group of us that worked on that very, very closely. Uh, and I was one of the ones involved because obviously I had that criminal law experience. Uh, that's what we need to do in the meantime. Uh, and we're going to put together a group that, that's going to discuss that and come up with some recommendations. And then I want to see what the legislature is willing to do. 
but there, I look at those tax bills when, when you receive a tax bill and you all pay property taxes either directly or indirectly. It doesn't say that you're a Democrat. It doesn't say that you're Republican, Independent, Green Party, you know, unregistered. It just says this is what you owe, and you're going to have to pay it. Well, if you're going to have to continue to pay it, and nobody is making an effort to fix it, why would you keep reelecting those people? Speaking of the legislature, uh, it, things got a little heated towards the end of uh, the budget session. I know there was the press release that came out from the um, from the Senate Republicans saying that essentially you haven't been able to work with the Republican majorities. And do you have a response to that? Or are you going to be changing anything in the? Well, I, I think if you go back to what I went through, we've passed a ton of legislation that I've signed. We've sponsored a lot, so I disagree with them. I think they were a little uh, annoyed that they didn't get what they want. But you know, I have a duty to the taxpayers of Pennsylvania, and we believe that the budget was not in the balance that it, that it should be, and that if they want to have that funding that we take, took out, they have reserves. Pennsylvania doesn't have reserves, but the legislature has reserves. They could take the money from the reserves and fill in the holes uh, that they think that they have. But that money is not their money, it's not the House money, it's not Democrats, it's not Republicans, it's your money. And so if, they, you know, if people want to be upset at me for defending the taxpayers' uh, interests, go for it. But do you feel like you have a good relationship with the Senate leadership, uh, Senator President Scornati, uh, and the House leadership, uh, the Speaker, the Speaker, and the Leader? Define good relationship. Do we get along? Yes. Do we disagree? Yes. We disagree on different issues. If you look at the broad spectrum of uh, the, the caucuses, um, I want you to think about how broad the spectrum is in the House when you go from Daryl Metcalf to Gene DiGirolamo in one party. That's why when people say, well, you got the Republicans in both houses, you should, you should be able to get everything you want. And it doesn't work that way because they all want something. And they all have different perspectives and they're not willing to vote. You know, I, I would love to see the, uh, not in addition to pension, I'd love to see us get something done on liquor. It would seem to make sense that we would be able to do it. But everybody has their own personal interests. You know, personally, I don't gain anything out of it. The people of Pennsylvania do. It's called choice and convenience. It's called being in the 21st uh, century. I don't know that any of those do, but they how have a different, different constituency that they are uh, recognizing and making their decision based upon. And I don't know that it's necessarily a constituency that is the same as uh, the members of their uh, district that elect them. Um, why do you think liquor reform hasn't got done? Because about a year and a half ago, Measure actually got through the House, you're the first governor to actually get a piece of legislation, liquor reform, actually through a chamber of the legislature. So you, you took a big step there, and then it sort of bogged down between well, the two I chambers. I think I just spring. explained. There are certain interests out there. Mm -hmm. uh, first off, beer is already privatized to a certain extent. So that gets a little complicated. Okay? Um, and then, literally, there are personalities that, that do not like the New Jersey or Delaware system of being able to go buy in one location, they just don't like it. Well, what about the people of Pennsylvania? I think they do. I've, in fact, we know they like it because mm -hmm. they go over to New Jersey and they buy their alcohol and, and, and uh, liquor at the same place in the private sector. They bring it back to Pennsylvania and I'm told from the LCB that it's between 60 and 80 million dollars of border bleed every year from people going down in, into Delaware. And I, I think the, uh, uh, the one superstore is within, you know, a long drive, golf drive, of the border. People are going over there. People want that convenience, but you know, some of these legislators, they have their own personal uh, reason for not wanting to do that. So I would hope maybe you go talk to them, because mm -hmm. I just want to give people the choice of convenience. It would be nice to go into the grocery store and be able to go buy a, a six pack of beer and uh, a bottle of wine when you're getting ready for dinner. Uh, now, going back to the fact that we are semi-privatized when, when it comes to beer, you have the wholesale beer, beer distributor, you have the beer distributor who can only do cases. They'd like to see package reform, that they could do something. You have the bars, okay? You have convenience stores that would like to be able to to do something. So everybody comes at a different perspective. And the problem is you got to get 26 in the Senate and 102 in the House. Uh, now, 
if you remember, I campaigned on not having, not using walking around money. Do you regret that at all? <laughs> well, let's put it this way: it certainly has made the job tougher because you can't go out there and say, "Well, yeah, you vote with me, I'll give you this." But I don't think the people of Pennsylvania want it done that way. Uh, again, did I keep my promise? No, I'm a politician that tells you what they're going to do. Actually, I'm an elected official. Tells you what they're going to do and, and does it. I keep my promise. I would hope the people of Pennsylvania would recognize that because I can't tell you how many people do recognize it who come up to me and, you know, I, I, I don't know how to describe this. I don't, I don't call it, it's not a poll, but people come up, Governor, keep doing it. You're doing what you said you were going to do. And I don't know whether they're registered or not registered. I call it the T-shirt lobby. Because most of the times they're in a T-shirt. I'm going into a Wawa's or to a, into a Sheets or sitting down uh, for lunch. I mean, it happened today, uh, sitting down for lunch in a Wendy's coming down here. Uh, that people just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Skiing back to liquor, you, you really articulated all the various competing interests and why it's been such a tough slog to get it done. What can you do to get it over the hump? Do, do, do you have a strategy to kind of get this finally through the legislature and help convince the leaders to, well, to get something done? So I think you're right. I think well, a lot of people want well, to see it We happen. continue to push on them. Um, you know, it would help if you all pushed on them, frankly. I mean, there's only about three or four, and you, you, you can probably figure it out who it is if you're spending any time in the Capitol. Uh, as to you know, what's their reticence of doing this? What's their personal interest in doing this? But first off, let's talk with the Democrats. Why are they opposed to it? One reason, the unions. 3,000, 4,000 member union is going to hold up the state from having choice and convenience. All, you know, all the people of Pennsylvania that want to have that? Should, should one union have that much power? Why aren't the Democrats supporting choice and convenience for their constituents? I would bet if you just put, put it on the ballot, it would pass. We don't have referendum in Pennsylvania for that. But why aren't they being criticized for not giving any votes? Because I've yet to see criticism for them not giving votes. Same thing on the pension. You know, quiet on the pension. No. Why? Again, because of the public sector union. It's interesting to see somebody who's never been to Pennsylvania, never tried to buy a case of beer in Pennsylvania, go try and buy it the first time. And if you ever meet with my chancellor of you know, the state system of higher education, Frank Brogan, who came from Florida, ask him to tell you the story, you'll be on the floor laughing <laughs> of, of what he went through because it's, a, it's so arcane. I mean, please, let us get into the 21st century with everybody else. Uh, we, we have visitors come here. Why would you have a system like this? It's a good question. Why would we? Going back okay, to no, oh, sorry. No, let me. I'm sorry. Let me just finish one, one aspect. What I know is, if it doesn't get done this year, I'm coming right back at it next year. But I also know, if it doesn't get done this year, and I'm not governor, it's not going to happen. Because he's already said. In fact, he said he wants us to become the wholesaler to the other states around us. Yeah. You know, how's that work? Why would they come to us? Uh, why would they? Why does he want to put private businesses? in the other states out of business for Pennsylvania. I don't think they caught into that very well. well go, going back to the property tax issue a little bit, uh, here in Berks County, probably the thing we hear the most about is uh, property tax elimination, or essentially swapping with uh, higher sales and income taxes. Uh, that bill just passed the uh, Senate Finance Committee today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, moment behind it, at least in Berks County. Where, where do you stand on that? I mean. Well, the, the one thing I have told them, and I think it still has to go over to the, to the House, and the House has a, uh, a, a bill also, they have to be able to demonstrate that it is revenue neutral. You're not going to want to do something that's going to lose revenue at this point in time. I mean, as, as it's written now. If I mean, they, if, well, if they get a bill to me that's revenue neutral, do I sign it? Yes. I mean, as as it's as it's written now. I mean, do you see that being a possibility? That it's. That I it's can't. I, I I don't know. I can't comment on that right now. And they're running out of days to get it over to the house, passed in the house. I mean, first they got to get it passed in the Senate, and, and then they got to get it over the house and through that process. So the Senate has, after today, eight days on their calendar. The house has a couple more days than that. 
I always look at it. I work every day. I have every day available. Let's ask about uh, natural gas drilling. Uh, your opponent, Tom Wolf, wants to use a, a tax on natural gas drilling to fund education. Is there any way you would support a tax on natural well, gas drilling? Well, let's talk about what he wants to do first. Okay. Okay. How much does he want to do? What's the number? Mm -hmm. And how does he get there? I mean, I, you can say anything you want, but how's he going to get there? What's the percentage? I mean, we, um, in the primary, he had an ad up on TV, and we've sent out a thing on this, that it would bring in $500 million, his tax. Same rate, today his ad has been changed. It says a billion dollars. Why? Well, he needs to find money for all the spending he wants to do. But how about some details? How about some details to his personal income tax? He hasn't given it, not, not, his, not his own, I mean, his plan to increase personal income tax. Where are the details there? Because the people of Pennsylvania, they're going to have a clear choice in this election. Somebody who likes to hold the line on taxes and hold the line on spending, and somebody who wants to spend a lot more and wants to raise a lot more taxes. That's what this election comes down to. Okay? So where is he coming up with these numbers? Katie McGinty, on his behalf, was in Bucks County earlier this week or last week, said it'll raise $2 billion. Okay, so is it, when's, when's three coming? When's four coming? But how much money does he need for his spending? And we've been trying to figure out, looking at all his promises, what are we over, four billion? Four billion dollar increase in the budget just to cover the spending he wants to do so. You know, I believe in facts, I believe in reality uh, to it. Um, we already tax, I'm not defending the issue, here's a fact, um, I don't know, you guys get taxed, don't you? Okay, so you pay corporate taxes. Um, everybody pays their corporate taxes. The industry and everybody related to have paid their corporate taxes, their personal income taxes, their sales and use tax, their capital stock and franchise tax. $2.8 billion since 2008. That's a significant amount of money. We're the only state that has an impact fee. And in three years, that's been $636 million. If you remember Ed Rendell in his last year, he said if we, if we put uh, a tax on the natural gas, we get a uh, um, hundred million dollars, okay? Uh, we didn't put a tax, we put an impact fee, and we got 223 million in the first year. 636 you know, now, because they continue to drill here. We've gone from five to number two in the, pro in the production of natural gas. So, you know, what Mr. Wolf wants to do is, okay, we're gonna tax one industry, because it's making money. I don't, first of all, I don't know how you do that, but, you know, what's the next industry when he needs more money for his spending? Is it water? Is it uh, gravel? Is it timber? Well, last time I looked, it takes timber to build the cabinets that he distributes. Unfortunately, he doesn't buy them in Pennsylvania, he buys them in Indiana. Uh, but how do you single out that one industry? Is it gonna be coal? Although coal is being severely impacted by the EPA at, the, at this point. Uh, so he picks on one just because it's somewhere easy to say, I can get a lot of money there. And his ads say, it's our gas. Have you seen those ads? Is it our gas? Let me, I, mean, I can't take the word, is it our gas? I'll ask you, is it our gas? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? He says, it's our gas. We should be taxing it, right? Whose gas is it? And yet almost every other state does tax uh, 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 gas. Whose gas is it? Is it a state resource? Ooh, ooh. Not unless we own the property. It's your gas if you own the property. Now, if that's the case, is it being taxed? Oh yeah, because mm -hmm. you're getting your royalties. And you're paying the tax on that. So this, it's our gas is kind of inciting people. Oh yeah, it's, you know, it's our gas, well, let's, let's be truthful. It belongs to the property owner who has the mineral rights. We do get money, we have, he hasn't counted that. We do get money, state games, the state game uh, commission, they get a significant amount of money. I don't know how much, maybe we should find out, Mike, how much they get. 
The DCNR gets it. We get our leases. We, we do get money from that. But it is not our gas. And for somebody who believes in personal property rights, it's offensive for me to, for somebody to say, what's well, our gas? Because it's not our gas. So, you know, but again, define how much you need and why you need it. He's putting the cart before the horse and he's, he's playing, it's a popularity, it's a populism issue. But the other states don't have corporate net income tax like we do. Our corporate net in, in, excuse me, income tax is 9.9%, second highest in the country. Texas is down around two or three, if I recall correctly, at four at the highest. Uh, they, have a, they do have a severance tax, which they suspend on a regular basis if you go down there. Um, they don't have a, an impact fee like we have. You know the other thing they don't have? Is a personal income tax. And so the leaseholders down there are not paying personal income tax. So which apple, orange, pineapple, whatever it is, do you want to look at? And he just wants to confuse the issue. The Democrats have been confusing the issue. It's a lot more complicated than they want to make it seem. And you know, uh, I, I think from a, a standpoint, what I see is an industry that has added uh, almost 28,000 jobs, maybe 30,000 jobs by now, direct, that if, if you've not taken a tour before now, and by now, please do it before the election, of what's going on in the areas where natural gas has revitalized counties and municipalities, school districts, everybody up there has been revitalized. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? You know, if that natural gas were just here in Reading, would you want anybody else, just everybody says it's ours? Probably not. Okay, now being a little facetious there. <laughs> but it is doing what it's supposed to do, and it lifts the whole state. Look at the jobs in southwestern Pennsylvania. Look at the jobs even in southeastern Pennsylvania. You know, I, I know of um, engineering companies from Lancaster that worked up there. I know of uh, operators from Philadelphia that work in there. It, it is doing that. But he wants to take more money from it because, and why? He needs it for more spending. He needs it because he doesn't want to deal with the pension system. He needs it because he wants to spend more and more money when that's not the solution. We need to work with the private industry to have them grow the economy of Pennsylvania, not tax it. So just to be clear then, you would not, if free elected, would not support any tax on natural gas? No, what I've said is we would have to work with the industry. Okay, what, what happens to the uh, impact fee, because in the legislation that exists now, it goes away. When you talked about the communities are getting revenue from that impact fee, because they're the ones that suffer the impact of it, and suffer is a relative term, but they're definitely seeing much more traffic than they ever saw uh, for, since the logging days went away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what happens to, what happens to them? How do we re recover that? When does the impact okay. fee go away? I don't recall in the legislation when it expires. Uh, yeah, yeah, but you know, it's a ten-year fee. Okay. Okay, it's a ten-year fee, but you know, because of the way we set it up, they're here. They're not in New York. Now New York won't let them there, but they're here. They're in Ohio. Ohio taxes them differently than we do. You know, they don't have an impact fee, but they have a lower uh, severance tax than we do. They have lower. I think they have lower personal. I'm not positive on that, so don't quote me on that. Okay. But if we get pension reform, I've said, and we get liquor, I'm open for discussions on revenue. Where do we get revenue? But if we get pension reform, we don't need as much revenue. Well, what kind of proposals would you support? I, I know this is something that's come up before, is that you'd be open to looking into other types of revenue if you get those. Uh, and, and I'm not going to, right now, I'm not going to... Uh, do any kind of hypotheticals on that because, I, you know, I'm focused on getting the reform first and then we'll look at, you know, what people may come up with. I do know one thing. He wants to raise taxes on a whole list of categories. I want to ask a more of a lo uh, local question. Obviously, you've spent some time in Reading just today and you've, we know you've been here before. Um, Reading's got some pretty daunting financial issues. They're struggling to attract more business uh, into the city and into the downtown core. As governor, what can you do or should you do 
to help Reading and other struggling cities across the state. What's the number one problem to the city of Reading financially? Lack of tax revenue. Okay. But where's the tax revenue going? What's the cost drivers? Cost drivers are always going to be law enforcement, mm -hmm. and I, you know I believe in that. Mm -hmm. But pensions are really driving the issue. If you, everybody keeps wanting to talk somewhere else, no. You fix, there's no silver bullet, but you start addressing the pensions, you start addressing the, the uh, people looking at how much you're going to have to tax. Maybe they come into the town then if you, they think that there's going to be control of the pension system so they don't get taxed. You get Moody's back on board with us and start raising our uh, credit rating. We raise our credit rating, our borrowing uh, costs go down. And that works for the cities as, as much as it does for the state. But it drives back to the pension almost every time. You get businesses to come in here, your tax rates go up. What's going to happen with Goggle Works with the areas around it? It's going to help the tax rates uh, go up, you know, uh, eventually. But nothing gets fixed overnight. And unfortunately, um, it didn't get this way overnight either. And I came down here, I think I said at the event today, I've been coming down here since 1967. My, uh, one of my three other roommates in college was from Reading. We'd come down here. Uh, it was a much different town then. You weren't here, right? No. Uh, you weren't alive. <laughs> <laughs> but a much different town then than it is today. It was a vibrant town. There were mills and everything here. Uh, look at all the buildings that are now being used for other things. It used to be um, fabric mills, if I remember correctly. Uh, then we started coming down here uh, when Moss Street first opened as an outlet center. And they did, did pretty well. But because we didn't deal with the issues then, government as a whole, it just kept getting progressively worse. The other aspect is, and I think Pittsburgh is starting to address this somewhat, is trying to get more people to move back into town. The suburbs grew up, you know, you could do the urban, urban suburban issue, go back to the 50s and 60s when the first suburbs began and they continued to expand and there's a lot of people, there are a lot of nice homes in Reading. Uh, that maybe aren't so nice now, but they were 40, 50 years ago, where those people moved out and they went to somewhere else and bought in another area that spread out. Pittsburgh's working very hard on getting a lot more people to move downtown and, and move in, into the city. To the point that, and, and they're doing it pretty much on, on their own, a little help from us, uh, that according to the U-Haul report, it's the number one destination for two years in a row now of their stuff. And it's all young people going in there. What Goggle Works does, it gets, a, you know, artists may be coming here. It starts attracting uh, more people to see a different Reading. And you have to really become a different Reading. You're not going to bring the uh, fabric mills back to Reading. It's not going to happen. Just like we didn't bring the steel industry back to uh, Pittsburgh. But we're probably going to bring a plastics industry to Pittsburgh with the development of the ethylene cracker facility out in Beaver County. Switching gears a little bit, uh, let's talk a bit about the Common Core standards. Uh, you've spoken a little bit about those in the, in the past week or so. Uh, can you care to elaborate on uh, on your position? Well, uh, I'll pretty much repeat what we've said. We, you know, legislature at our request eliminated the federal Common Core. We still have Pennsylvania standards. We probably shouldn't have used the word core in there because people, you know, ears go up on core. Uh, but in conversations that I've had with people for the last mm, two months, on both sides of the issue, it's clear that many of them didn't feel like they were involved in the decision-making process between the legislature and you know, over at the Department of Education. So um, we're opening it up for some hearings to see if they have anything to input into it that would, that would change it. Do we still need standards? I think so. Uh, I, I look at people's um, writings at all levels, and the younger they get, the worse it's getting. Um, you know, uh, industry, academia, and the military are looking for certain standards that people should be able to do when they get out of high school, and I agree with that. I think you all agree with it. 
technology today, I mean, to work in a manufacturing shop, you have to be, in many of them, you have to be able to work a computer. Now, the computer does a lot of thinking for you, but you've got to be able to work it. You've got to have that skill. Um, so. Along the same lines as, uh, as the school, I know there's been a lot of talk now about uh, ch changing a school funding formula. There's, there's a commission set up by the legislature. Uh, do you have any ideas of what needs to be done to? A lot of work and a lot of prayers. <laughs> How many school districts? 501. 500. We actually had a merger a couple of years ago between two schools. A voluntary merger, no less. We might have a couple more, too. Um, there are probably 500 different positions minimum as to what's fair. Define fair for me. Define it. Mm -hmm. They have a great challenge and I, I am for a fair funding formula but you've got to get 103, 102 members of the House and 26 members of the Senate to agree on what is a fair funding formula. Each one of those has school districts. Each one of those school districts views it in an eye most favorable to themselves I am sure. So, help me define it. Now, is it a per capita? Should all students across Pennsylvania get one level? It's the easiest way, isn't it? Okay, the state's got to come up with, you know, pick a number. All students will get that and the school districts go figure it out. That's the easy way. Would you want that way? I bet you you could find about 15 different directions on that, can't you? Okay. Let's compare um, a Philadelphia to a Harrisburg or to a, or to a Reading. Or, since I taught in Pine Grove, to a Pine Grove. Yeah, not that far from here. How do you compare them? What are the needs? The needs are different. The first thing that they have worked on, and we're supposed to be getting a report, is the Special Education Funding Report. And that is one of the drivers, in addition to pension, that is driving school district budgets through the ceiling. Part of that is driven by the fact that the federal government said, when they did it, that they would continue to fund uh, special education at 48, 49 percent all the time. Today, they fund it at 17 to 18 percent, and the state and local school district has to pick it up. That's why I never believe Washington when they say they're going to do something. It's a prime example. Um, so how does that factor in? Because one school district may have a number of children in special ed, the other one may not. And you know, special education funding takes more money out of the budget than that per capita number. And it's the same amount of money no matter the degree of need of special education. So that's a problem. Um, how about the school district's ability to collect their ta owed taxes? Should that be factored in? I, mean, I met with the editorial board of the Inquirer last week, you probably read. And the one thing I told them, I said, you have over a half a billion dollars in uncollected real estate taxes, yet you're asking the state for additional money? If I'm a legislator, it's not me, if I'm a legislator in another part of the state, why am I voting for Philadelphia to be able to impose a, a, their own tax when they're not clearly making an effort in their mind, I don't know this to be the case, but making an effort to collect the taxes. Shouldn't that be the first step to collect your own taxes? What percentage should be, should the state give? 50%, and that's what my opponent says, define 50% for me. 50% of what? Okay, 50% of everything? Let's assume that. 500 school districts, 50%, right? Okay, 500 school districts combined federal, state, and local money going into it, I believe is $27 billion in education, K through 12 right now. So what's 50%? 13 something if I do my math roughly. So we're already at 10 billion for K through 12 in Pennsylvania. So you're gonna add $3 billion? Well, maybe that's why you wanna tax everybody else. Okay, so 50%, hmm. But what's the wild card in all the planning that you do when it comes to education funding? Who creates, how many contracts are there? Teachers contracts in Pennsylvania? 
Anybody? Well, at least 500. Bingo. <laughs> okay. And who negotiates the contract? School boards and teachers unions. Okay. Now, who's not sitting at that table? The state. Bingo. Yet, you're going to the state saying, we need more money. It's easy if you, oh, okay, we're in a contract. So if it's a 50%, then each year they say, well, we're going to go up, and school district A is going to give X percent of an increase to the salaries. School district B goes uh, um, Y percent. So the state has to react to that each time without having any say in the matter. Does that make any sense whatsoever? You're not at the table. How many health care contracts are there in Pennsylvania? It's not 500, I can tell you that. Okay. I don't know the exact number because there are some places where they do it by intermediate unit. Do you think there's cost savings there? You know, state employees who have one health care contract. What would you do if you were, if it was one person making the decision, as you probably do here, you would, okay, I've got to find, I've got to save money. Where's a place to save money? Health care. Yet, that's part of a contract and the state's not sitting at the table. So the state has always looked at it as the bank that is going to supply more money, but with no rights to say, whoa, wait a second, you can't do that in this one because it's going to cost more over here and more over there. So you either want local control or you don't want local control. You understand now why I say this is not as easy as people make it sound in, in a 30-second TV ad. And I guarantee you people haven't looked at it and I haven't looked at it in depth. I just sit in the car a lot. <laughs> how do we do? How do we find that fair? Because I would be, I think everybody would be happy if they said there's a fair funding formula. But if you came up with one, I guarantee you, 49% of the people would be unhappy, and 51% of the people would go, oh, maybe. But do we do we have to find that? Yeah. Am I willing to continue to work on that? Yes. But I'm not willing to continue to put the burden on the back of the taxpayers without protecting their interests at the state level. I wanted to ask a different education question about higher education. Cause when you came in and, or when some of the budget challenges you just came in with your first year in office, you cut uh, funding to Penn State and state relate and state system schools that include Kutztown. In the last few years, funding's been flat. Do you see if you get into office uh, for a second term, any uh, possibility of putting more money into higher education? Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, you know, we'd like to be able to be in that position but at the same time, one of the reasons I have such a good uh, chancellor at the state system of higher education, I want him looking at those system schools along with the, with the state board. How many schools do we have, higher education schools in Pennsylvania? 14 in the state system, the four state related. I have no idea how many private colleges It's about have. over 138. Think about that. How many, st here's a question for you. How many teachers do we graduate on average per year in Pennsylvania. Kid goes to college, gets, gets the loans, gets debts. How many teachers on average? Ballpark it for me. Several thousand, I would guess. 12,000. You remember. 12,000. How many vacancies do we have? 3,000. So we're sending children to college Encourage them to become a teacher, which uh, I became a teacher. I didn't go there to become a teacher, but I didn't, okay, maybe I'll try this. I always, I knew I always wanted to be a lawyer, but you know, we encourage them to go there. They get debt, yet they have a one in four chance of being a teacher in Pennsylvania. Hmm. We export students to Maryland, to New Jersey, to Delaware, to Virginia, to Alabama, to Florida, to South Carolina, to North Carolina. Yet, we want our kids to stay here, yet we're exporting them out. Because, as one young girl told me, literally, she gave me a note a couple years ago, mad at me, Governor Quirby, I was guaranteed a job as a teacher when I graduated from college. And she didn't sign it and she left after she gave me the note. Like, I don't know who guaranteed you that. Nobody should ever guarantee anybody anything, uh, except your best efforts. Uh, and I feel badly for it. I feel badly for a lot of those children. But where do we need people? What jobs do we need to fill? 25% of the trades, people who work in the trades, are 55 or older. 
well, maybe we can get some people to do that. I mean, different kind of job, but we definitely need to, to be going there. We need a lot more in the area of technical. Um, Two-year certificates. B. Braun Industries up in uh, Allentown, a medical device uh, company from uh, Germany. I took a tour of that back, I think it was last fall. And I walked through with the people and walked down a long hallway and there were these clean rooms on both sides. That was the factory. Everybody's dressed in white and everything. I said, what do you need in there for education? Two-year degree. But we don't have enough two-year schools. So we need to take a look at that. In addition to just high, higher ed. That's why one of the other things we did, and I didn't even touch upon this yet, is that we created a commission on post-secondary education using that word purposefully. Not higher education, post-secondary. Because there are jobs there. There are jobs right now in Pennsylvania at around 200,000 jobs that are sitting open today as I talk to you. And you go to our Job Gateway website that we created. Some of them require skills that maybe the people don't have. They come to us, we can try and get them, if they have the ability, we can try and get them the skills to do those jobs. So we're working on that. We're not just saying, well, let's put everybody on unemployment. We're trying to get them off unemployment and into jobs. I think that's very important. But you've got to take a look at that whole higher education system, um, post-secondary education system together. That's why um, Mansfield University up in uh, Tioga County, uh, declining uh, in enrollment. And you know many of the schools are seeing declining enrollment right now because it's a declining population. They're looking at alternatives to have more courses that will help with getting jobs in the natural gas fields up there. I think some other colleges are Penn Tech in Williamsport. It's kind of related to Penn State. Heavy emphasis on the natural gas fields and, and the jobs that are there, how to use the equipment there. Um, so we have to be much more flexible than the, than the old school, this is what we're going to do. And I'll complete the answer, the long-winded answer to, to this one, with what happened back last year about October when uh, Clarion announced that they were going to close the music education department. And it was a big deal across the state. You probably wrote on it. Uh, and I was severely criticized. You're not funding it enough. They have to close the music de education department. So I called Frank Brogan, the chancellor. And he wasn't even in office yet. I said, huh, it seems like the president's making a financial decision. What's the story? He said, Governor, do you know how many students there are in the music education department? I said, no. Four. Would you keep a music education department open if there were only four students? Yeah, the music department and then the music education department. Were there some faculty that may have been let go? Probably. But how do you maintain a course for four students in this day and age with all the other alternatives that you have out there for education and the needs for education? So they made a, a very wise, I think, financial decision. People were mad at me for it, but it's, you know, it is, what does the market want? market right now needs people with technical degrees. They need much more. Have you ever been down to uh, Stevens Tech? To see Stevens Tech right over in Lancaster? If you haven't, I encourage you to go there because it teaches trades. 50% of their student body has a four-year degree already. But they want to go back and learn different skills. Down in Delaware County, there is the Williston School. It was created, uh, it was actually a forerunner to Hershey where um, the individual back in the, I think, 1800s, early 1900s, created a school to take people off the street, give them a trade. They don't pay a thing. They have to pay for their books. That's it. They live in dormitories that sort of look like military barracks, brick military barracks, for, um, six days a week. They're not allowed to walk on the grass. They can get demerits, but they're given a skill. Every student in the masonry department has a job before he walks out the door. We should be replicating that around the state because do you ever get somebody to do bricklaying work anymore? I mean, it's an art that we're losing. So there are potential, great potential jobs out there that unfortunately we have, a, uh, we're emphasizing just, well, let's sit at a computer. And I can say that because my son sits at a computer. <laughs> you know, he has his master's in entertainment technology from CMU, works for EA Games. You know, that is there, but, you know, 
Everybody can't do that. And we know where we need the jobs. So that's where I'm trying to encourage education to go. And you know, our education funding, we have to be more flexible uh, about it. That was one of, if you remember, we created the Marcellus Shale Commission, Transportation Commission, the TFAC Commission, uh, um, the Post-Secondary Education Commission. What's the third one? Or the fourth one? There's a fourth one. I'm drawing a blank. No, it wasn't. It was something else. I forget. Anyhow, every one of those commissions, we did not leave the report sitting on a bookcase. We have implemented it. Manufacturers, we're implementing. What are their needs? How do we, how do we align education with, uh, with the needs of manufacturing today? Because manufacturing today is considerably different. It is not, depending on the, on the uh, industry, it is not a dirty place to work. In fact, it's probably a pretty clean place. Have you ever seen 3D or advanced manufacturing in person? If you haven't, you have to go see it. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Mm -hmm. The other day I saw a drone. Wingspan this big, fuselage this big, all one piece. The only thing they need to add in are the guidance controls and the uh, uh, fuel cell. You know, how does it take off? It was all one piece, just made in the machine. Not exactly a dirty place. It can get dusty if you, you know, with the uh, materials that they use. But that's the future. A lot. Heavy foundry work is not the future. Yeah. Um, and that's trying to get people to take a look. This is my problem. I've never looked at this as a two, four, six year cycle. I've always looked at it the 10, 20, 30 year cycle. This has to be reminiscent of the conversation we had in my office when we talked about it. that's what Reading has to do. That's what every city has to do. We can't be saying, what are we doing today? We gotta be looking, how do we get to 10 years from now? How do we get there? And boy, in politics, that's the hardest thing to do because everybody thinks of getting reelected. Yeah, I'm going to win, but if I don't get reelected, I know I went into doing what I thought was the best interest of Pennsylvania. And we are in a much better position today than we were four years ago. And we get four more years, we're going to be in a much better situation. Whoever comes in behind me then is going to be able to take it even further. Because we are growing an economy of Pennsylvania that is diversified. We get the education system matching up to what we need, combine it with our location, combine it with building roads, combine it with our energy, we'll be leading this country. So going back to the colleges, uh, one of the things that you had challenged them to do is try and keep tuition increases to a minimum, or at least keep a level. How, how do you think they're doing? They've been doing good. Uh, they have been. It's 3% or lower. Uh, and, you know, I, Certainly, I'd like to see them keep it even lower. But compared to the way it had been before that, I think it had been going like this. We, you know, somebody had to say, you know what? It's about education. It's not about building all these buildings. Uh, you know, private schools, if they want to build the buildings like that, that's that's fine. For public schools and the, and the state system, buildings that need to be replaced, yes. But we do not need huge buildings in a difficult economic time. We do it in a time that we have the money. Well, that might be a different story. Go and go fundraise. Private schools have to do that. They have to go fundraise. They can't just go to the taxpayers. They can go to their alumni. And if they continue to raise, and some of them are. I mean, you you look at the cost of some of the, of the colleges. I mean, I look at you know the schools at like Eleven Valley and Albright and stuff. I'm amazed at what it costs now. You know, the good quality schools, but wow. It really costs a lot. And those, those are debts that those kids are going to have for a long time. I think when I went to Lebanon Valley, I think it was $3,000. That was in the 60s. But I, I think if you did the rate of inflation, it's not anywhere close at that point. Now, going, just finishing up on this, taking K through 12 education, you're doing it here in Reading with uh, what they are doing with Reading Area Community College and being able to send some of their students
particularly more in the hands-on skills, getting them degrees there, and tying up uh, and connecting them with Bloomsburg with a relationship there that after they get their two-year certificate and so forth, they can go into and pick up their other two years so they can get a bachelor's or something. That's a model that we need to replicate more around the state. And I think other uh, community colleges and, and state system schools are, are starting to take a look at that. But that's also a very cost-effective model for the student. Much better to be paying at the, at the uh, community college level than getting a degree in something that really doesn't have a workforce need at a higher rate. Get into something that's going to, you know, you're going to be able to have a job. Um, sometimes I wonder what's going to happen to your profession. Seriously, you know, all the journalism schools and everything, because your profession is changing so fast, what's going to happen? And I have no idea. But I'll be done in four years, so. <laughs> but for you, it's going to be interesting. Okay. And you. I put you guys in my age, too. <laughs> I uh, wanted to ask a minimum wage question. Uh, a lot of states uh, have been raising the minimum wage over the last several years. 23 states have the minimum wage that's higher than the federal minimum. We're still at the federal minimum. Do you see any, uh, if you were reelected, do you see any possibility of raising Pennsylvania's minimum wage? I, I don't see a willingness in the, in the uh, House and the Senate to do that right now. I think everybody's more inclined to go along with the federal government, let them send it uh, or set it. Um, as a matter of fact, I think you, you know, if you talk to industry, uh, it, they believe it makes you somewhat uncompetitive uh, in that respect. And uh, you know, I'd have to look at my note, all the details about it. But I kind of, looking at that, say this is a federal government issue, uh, and um, I hope that we're, and I'm working to get people jobs that are more family sustaining jobs than looking at working on jobs that are minimum wage their entire career. Now, did you ever work at a minimum wage job? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. I was pumping gas. I was working, uh, I, was, I was working at a uh, Burger King. And it was minimum wage, but it was never intended in my mind to be my career. Okay? Uh, and I hope that we don't look at minimum wage jobs as the intention of being careers. We want to get them into something else. And when I have 200,000 job vacancies in Pennsylvania, I know I have other jobs out there. We just got to match their skills to it or get them the skills to it. That should really be the goal. The Senate right now is, is taking up uh, the, the medical marijuana <coughs> bill. I mean, it's, it's supposed to at least have some discussion at least in the next couple of weeks. Probably one of the biggest questions for them is whether or not it's going to get signed if it hits your desk. Do you have no. any thoughts of this? No. I mean, first, first off, mm -hmm. I find it. How do I want to very politely put this? How is it that they're able to pass a law that violates the federal law because marijuana being an illegal drug is determined by the federal government, not the state? How can they pass that? and not get liquor reform done. And Again, common sense. Now, having the, the law enforcement background that I do, it is a gateway drug. I know they're talking about uh, medicinal, but I encourage you to go study the problems in California where they did the same thing. Oh, it's medicinal. And they have doctors out there just writing scripts left and right for the basically the recreational use of marijuana. Now I have said, and we were working on a test of the CBD oil, and, and if the legislature passes that, then the tests show that there is some conclusive result and it's not addictive, sure, you know, I, I would be willing to sign that. But again, let's turn to Washington. Why aren't they dealing with this? This is not an individual state issue. This is a national issue. It's a federal issue. But they just went, oh, no, let's not deal with tough questions. And I'm talking about the administration and Congress. Mm -hmm. Let's not talk about tough questions. Let's, you know, let's throw that to the states. Look at Colorado. They're not doing all that well. And 
based on my background, recreational use of marijuana is clearly an addictive drug. It's a gateway drug to other problems. Now, you know one of the reasons that we have difficulty filling 200,000 jobs? Drug tests. Exactly. Do you drug test when people come here? People fail it? Yeah. Why do you drug test? Do you know why you drug test? You mean? Reliability. Reliability, and probably your insurance tells you you have to drug test, right? Okay, so we got that problem. Before we ever start signing any bills, how are you going to deal with that issue? How's it where, you know, hmm, we, we, we're we going to say it's legal in a state, yet you still can't get hired because you're being drug tested. With a good legitimate reason for reliability, for safety issues. Nobody wants to talk about that in any of the stories I've read. Nobody wants to talk about that. I'd love to see... You know, the question to uh, um, the two senators, you know, now they're talking medical marijuana, okay? Let's talk about, I mean, I, I'm convinced the one wants to go much, much further than medical marijuana. Delaware County wants to go to recreational use of marijuana. You know, how's that going to work out with drug testing? In Philadelphia, just apparently they're taking some to essentially decriminalize small amounts of marijuana. What authority do they have to decriminalize it? That should be the question. What authority? Now, I mean, why pass a bill? You just direct your police officers, don't do anything. What authority? Because the last time I looked, it's a federal law, it's a state law, and it's not a Philadelphia law. That's the discouraging part about all this. It's telling young people, well, you just disregard the law if you don't like it. Okay, that's what they want to do. Kind of on, on the related topic of health care, um, the federal government just uh, just gave approval to your plan. I mean, wh what do you think it's going to do as far as increasing coverage? Uh, well, the, it does a couple things. One, it will increase coverage. One, number one, it lets us reform the Medicaid system that hasn't been reformed since it was created. We have the second expen most expensive Medicaid system in the country. Uh, at about $7,400 per capita. Um, the average is about $4,400 to $5,400. Uh, and the reason we had the second most expensive is we kept having, it, I don't know why they call them waivers, but they would call it waivers, where we would make more programs available. A lot of them weren't being used, but we were paying for it. Sort of like going out and buying a car with all the bells and whistles and using one bell and one whistle. Well, why would you pay for that? Uh, so this reform basically allows us to break it down into um, low risk and high risk. You know, you're probably a low risk, okay? Um, somebody my age might be a high risk, okay? Uh, why not pay for them on, on that? That in and of itself saves us, um, I've got to remember, 170 million, 170 or 145? 170, I think. We'll get the number for you. $170 million to our budget in the first year. That's important because the federal government, from our federal Medicaid money, reduced us this year by $340 million. Just done, gone. Remember, we rely on federal money. Oh, no, no, we're just not sending it to you this year. Okay? Our second year, it saves us um, over $700 million. And in eight years, it saves us a total of $4.5 billion for the taxpayers. If you're looking for money. This is a place to do money. It encourages the, it encourages the person in that... Um, Category of um, one thirty, or excuse me, uh, one hundred one percent to one hundred thirty percent, or one hundred thirty eight percent of poverty, to go out and purchase it on the private market with a premium. Premium is two percent of income. And we had a lot of people. Oh, you, you can't charge them two percent of income. Well, we'll do this. We want you to have uh, healthy behaviors. 
we encourage healthy behavior. So if you go to the doctor once a year, we'll reduce your premium by 50%. We're all encouraged to go to the doctor once a year. I know Healthy PA has me going, uh, not Healthy PA, the, the state uh, program that we have. I have to go once a year, I have to give blood once a year and all that. Okay, you get a premium reduction. Kind of works. We also wanted to do a job search, because remember I got 200,000 jobs over here. Uh, and Medicaid said, no, you can't link that to Medicaid money. We said, how about if we do a voluntary one and we use some money that we have from the Federal Department of Labor? They agreed to that, which is just amazing. So that if somebody demonstrates to us that they are actively looking for work, or we can help them connect with a career link program and do that, we'll reduce that tuition or that premium another 50%. So we're making this as easy as we possibly can, but what we're encouraging is healthy behavior and what we're trying to do is give a hand up rather than just expanding an entitlement program where people felt no sense of responsibility to the program. I would hope by going to the doctor and somebody says, you know, you have diabetes and you don't know it, and they'll start and they'll go get the medicine and obviously they're gonna get the medicine. Isn't that important in the long term? Don't use the emergency room for, um, something that's not an emergency. We do have a little $8 copay penalty if they use the emergency room for something that's not an emergency. Go to an urgent care center or something like that. So it is the most reasonable approach and the first time the federal government has given a, a, a state the flexibility that we should have and it fits Pennsylvania. So, you know, it, it, I know my opponent said we should just expand it. In fact, Katie McGinney said we should expand it. We'd take that money that we got from the federal government and it would balance the budget. How's that work? It doesn't work that way. Because you have to pay, take the money to expand it to use for the program. You can't use it somewhere else. And I think even he has said that once or twice, hasn't he? Yeah. He wants to use it somewhere else. And that's what got us in trouble. We are? Yes. <laughs> oh, I, I see it out there, yeah. Okay. We have the last one. Do we have time for one more or do you need to? You can do sure. one more. Okay. One more. Let's ask about transportation, getting back to mm -hmm. one of your successes actually from last year. You got the transportation funding package put through, uh, which is good news for people who have been waiting for the widening route toward 222 in Berks County. Is there anything that can be done to sort of s accelerate some of this funding going forward to get some of these repairs going in roads and bridges? I mean, I know a lot of these are years-long projects, but... It's, uh, there's some of these things, especially with bridge repairs. Well, you know what, I'd, I'd have to actually send Barry Shunk down here. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a construction season, and um, you are going to see next year a lot more in the bridges mm -hmm. because we put together a um, 600, we have 600 bridges we're going to do in a pack. We're breaking it down, public-private partnership. They're going to be working on 600 bridges across Pennsylvania, and people are going to be swearing at me because they're going to be sitting in traffic. <laughs> yeah, we're part of that effort here, uh, you know, getting, communicating to the public about yeah. the bridges being uh, worked on going into red. So much are falling down as they walk yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, literally, you have one lane closed just because it's gotten so old on, the, on one of these bridges. Uh, it's going to be a nightmare, but it's, you know, it's a long Temporary time. Temporary inconvenience, glad, glad permanent happen. improvement. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, this year are they repaving? Oh, they're repaving everywhere. I sit in more traffic uh, jams. Uh, in fact, we always check it on Google Map. Okay, where's construction? Okay, go around. You know, because that's one thing you can do with Google Map now. You know, check your traffic. Oh, there's construction. You know, take a side road or something. But uh, I, I don't know. There's anything that can really speed it up. And what are we in the middle of September? So we have until the middle of November before the construction season kind of shuts down. And then it'll start up again in March, uh, but then the bridges and everything uh, will be coming on because the public-private partnership, uh, they've all competed and I think they're splitting up the number of bridges. But the one beautiful thing is we're not redesigning every bridge individually. We're doing it by packs. For bridges so long, this is the pack you use. So you're not paying duplicative, particularly on design, you get to more into materials and more into bridges than uh, design. So uh, we're trying to kind of standardizing, you know, uh, Ford comes to building bridges. Well, interchangeable parts. You know, build it the same way. Okay? Yeah.
Thanks for your time. Thanks for coming here. Thank we you. really appreciate your time and answering all these questions. Thank you.